Thanks for coming. Welcome to St. Thomas. I'm the newest member of the St. Thomas faculty. I don't teach contracts. I teach business associations and civil procedure, both for the first time at the same time. Um, so I'm really <laughs> delighted to be here uh, to welcome you to St. Thomas. Prior to coming to St. Thomas, I, I've been practicing employment law since 1996. So uh, that's why Jennifer Martin asked me to moderate this panel. And I am uh, very excited uh, for these three panelists. We are going to let each of them talk for about 20 minutes and take questions at the end, so please write down your questions. First will be Meredith Miller. I had the pleasure of meeting Meredith actually at a conference in West Virginia on business and human rights where she also talked about employment law issues and I got very excited. So I was really happy to see that she'd be here today. She has the sexiest title of the conference, Getting Paid in the Naked Economy. Um, so I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing what she's going to talk about. And basically, she'll be talking about freelancers and contractual legislative and other ways to increase their chances of receiving compensation. She teaches contracts, business organizations, and employment law at Turo, and has been voted Professor of the Year twice. So I'm trying to figure out what she does right. What did I do wrong? <laughs> okay. um, the next person who's going to go will be Rachel Arno Richmond from the University of Denver. And she plans to discuss something close to my heart, so I'll probably learn all the things I was doing wrong as an employment lawyer, both as inside um, in-house counsel and as an, as an outside counsel. Um, she's going to talk about the issue of adequate consideration, and this is something that we dealt with a lot. This is a real-world issue. What is adequate consideration when you change the terms and conditions of employment? So I'm looking forward to that. She also teaches employment law and contracts and is dire director of Denver's workplace law program. And finally coming from the farthest, and I think he landed last night from Tokyo. Um, he's going to add an international and an economics component to the presentation. Masaki Nak Nakabayashi will talk about the transition of the role of the courts and labor markets, focusing on the silk reeling industry, which I did not know was the driving force of Japan's industrialization. He is a PhD from the University of Tokyo and is currently an associate professor at the Institute of Social Science in, at the University of Tokyo. So each panelist will go for 20 minutes. We'll keep questions till the end. And thanks again for coming. Well, thank you, Marcy, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, St. Thomas and, of course, Jennifer for putting together such a, a wonderful uh, conference. Next year it's going to be hard to follow. Um, this is not the most academic-y of talks. Um, I am being recorded, though, right? So that'll limit the extent of uh, the metaphor I use about uh, use with getting paid um, and being naked. Um, but the title um, is Getting Paid in the Naked Economy. And it's really uh, a talk that's informed by work I've been doing more recently with small businesses, freelancers, and startups, kind of on the side of this law professor gig. And I think there's a lot to say about that experience that could be the subject of an entirely different talk. Uh, about what it is, what the future of being a law professor is or maybe even should be. I'm going to set that aside, though, and say what I've had is a number of freelancers come to me with unpaid invoices. And they don't have much recourse. They don't have much recourse because, for the most part, most of them that have come to me don't have written contracts or they have agreement. They, they have contracts, but they're not in writing, right? Um, and the amount in the invoices uh, just isn't enough where it's worth any uh, attorney uh, really getting involved to help them uh, get paid. So the, the, the problem um, I have seen is trouble getting paid. And as you'll see in this talk, it's not only my own anecdotal experience, but uh, surveys have shown that this is uh, a, a problem uh, with being a freelancer. So what I want to do is place the anecdotes um, within a trend uh, in, in of work going uh, to, to independent uh, work. Uh, and that's in part the, here the uh, naked economy, which we'll talk about. Uh, then discuss this problem uh, with getting paid and talk about some of the solutions in contract and uh, potential legislative reforms. Um, so let's start with this uh, trend in the rise of independent work. And there are a lot of definitional problems here right from the start. Uh, what does it mean to describe someone as a freelancer? Who am I talking about now when I'm talking about independent workers? And for the most part, uh, I'm talking about consultants, uh, people we call freelancers, contractors. I've seen a new word uh, surface, at least it's new to me recently, solopreneur. Um, I don't even know if I'm saying it correctly. But really the independent workers I'm talking about are highly skilled, right? Um, highly skilled and working on an independent in, the independence is really on a project basis. Um, so 
they might and probably do come within the definition of what a lot of academics like to call contingent workers or people who do non-standard work, but I think that's much broader uh, than what uh, I'm talking about here. And you know, the definition the Bureau of Labor Statistics gives for um, uh, contingent workers are those who have no explicit or implicit contract and expect their jobs to last no more than a year, which is really almost every worker in the U.S. economy given employment at will. Uh, so it's not uh, very uh, useful. And the language used to describe people who work on a project basis or are independent changes depending on the perspective of who's uh, uh, discussing uh, them. There's a recent uh, Accenture report, the consulting uh, firm, that talks about this workforce as the extended workforce. Uh, and talks about these individuals being jobless but not uh, workless. Uh, but there's no question that, I know this is not going to be easy to read, but I couldn't resist anyway. Um, you know, there's no doubt that the rise in independent work has really been at the demand of um, big companies, companies that don't want to have employees. There's a lot of advantages uh, to having independent contractors over employees. Uh, from you know uh, vicarious liability to uh, not having uh, your workers come within Fair Labor Standards Act, anti-discrimination statutes, also tax and, and benefit advantages. Uh, this, what you can't read here is it, it probably because it's way too small. Uh, is an, it's a conversation uh, between two executives, and one says, you know, you see, I'm paraphrasing it, but you see that guy out there with the glasses. He's highly skilled. You know, he does uh, a great work and. Uh, we hired him as a consultant, he gets no vacation, we don't have to pay him benefits, um, uh, we're paying him a low salary, this, this is great, and so what I'm thinking we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all 6,500 employees we have, uh, get rid of them and rehire them as consultants. And so the other executive says, that's a great idea, it's brilliant. Uh, when do we start? And the response is we, right? Um, so this has really been at the demand of uh, uh, employers or, or people who are using the services of the, the workers. But there's um, a, a new spin on this, um, which really um, is, is talking about going to independent work as a choice. Um, and you know, the, the numbers show um, that uh, uh, there's a rise in independent work. Now, this is a study from a group called MBO Partners. And the best way to quickly describe them is as an interme intermediary uh, for um, small uh, or, or freelance freelancers uh, intermediary between them and, and bigger businesses but uh, so, so they have a stake in seeing more people be independent so uh, take uh, take the statistics uh, with a grain of salt uh, and uh, uh, realize that even in this study it was hard for me to pin down who they were defining as independent workers that said um, they've been doing a yearly study 16 million in 2011 up to 16.9 million in 2012 and they're estimating 23 million independent workers in 2017. And so what I was about to mention before is the narrative surrounding this independent work, right? We're seeing among these highly skilled workers um, a changing narrative of choice, right? Uh, rather um, than uh, put this all on the employers and what they're demanding, uh, the narrative has been that uh, we should ditch the man, right? We have these skills uh, rather than um, you know, the structures of a nine to five work day and all the face time and the commute, um, go, go out on your own, right, and um, chart your own course. And this is captured in a, a recent book called The Rise of the Naked Economy, which is how I bring in uh, that uh, term to try to give this talk, uh, talk somewhat of a, what you call a sexy title. Um, but you know, again, a book to be taken uh, with some perspective, it's written by uh, two authors, one who owns co-work spaces, uh, which are popular for independent workers, freelancers, uh, and the other who uh, started a site called Elance, which I'll mention in, in a second. Um, uh, so they have a stake in seeing people go independent, but the, the book uh, talks about uh, the rise in the naked economy with this narrative of, of independent workers uh, uh, choosing to go out on their own uh, and, and chart their own course. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question then becomes, well, what, is, what do they mean by uh, the naked economy? And I think what they mean in the book by the naked economy um, is an emphasis on independence, uh, but also uh, acknowledging, although downplaying, the vulnerability uh, of uh, people who are uh, working independently. Um, the narrative about this naked economy, what makes it naked? Well, we're stripping work bare. Let's figure out um, 
what you need to do the job you do and do it the best you can do it and most profitably, which means um, work, you know, finding work-life balance, um, chasing this dream of being your own uh, boss, not having to uh, commute to work, uh, not having uh, to make chit-chat around uh, the water cooler, uh, and um, really technology is makes, making this and the flexibility of it more and more uh, uh, possible. Uh, so uh, that's part of what's naked about the economy, and this really isn't a new idea, right? Uh, over 10 years ago, two books that came out, Rise of the Creative Class and Free Agent Nation, were, were talking about this, predicting it, and I think really, uh, if anything, what the, the book about the rise of the naked economy does is just show how this is coming to fruition with the technology that, that we have since those books were written, really make uh, independence uh, more possible. Um, but the other part of the naked economy, or what I think of when I think of the naked economy as a contracts law professor, is the vulnerability here, which, as I mentioned, I think is downplayed in this narrative about uh, going out on your own. Uh, but there's really a lack of written contracts um, and a lack of legal protections uh, for independent workers. And one of the big problems, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a problem with getting uh, paid. And it's not just my own anecdotes here. The Freelancers Union uh, did a study. Uh, 3,000 uh, uh, freelancers, independent workers, were surveyed. Uh, they were from 49 different states. And 42% of them reported uh, that they faced clients um, that weren't paying. They had non-payment problems. Uh, and of those, 83% said they were paid late, 33% were never paid, uh, and you see that some 20% uh, were paid less than they had uh, invoiced. Uh, so how do they handle this? Well, you can harass your clients, you can send demand letters, you could try to charge uh, late payment fees, although if you're not getting paid in the first place, right, uh, how good is a late payment fee? Only 4% hired attorneys to pursue unpaid wages, invoices, and then 2% ended up in small claims court. This is all time that's not productive time, by the way, right? Um, so what are the potential uh, solutions here? Well, uh, we're all uh, uh, contract professors. And by the way, I'm focusing on the problem of getting paid. There are obviously like, a lot of other protections that uh, this uh, growing segment of the workforce doesn't have, like unemployment benefits uh, being a key one. Uh, but what are some of uh, the solutions or the ways to patch in uh, what is a vulnerability uh, that's um, part of this naked economy. And part of the solution is contractual. Uh, there are some proposed legislative reforms, at least in New York. Thank you. And also uh, uh, some market solutions or do-it-yourself uh, uh, approaches that I think are worth mentioning. Um, so let me play this clip. Um, this is a, a little one-minute, 30-second video put out by um, a, a company called Doc. Docracy, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Whenever they make up these words, you're not really sure. Um, but it is an online repository of contracts for independent people to look to to try to come up with their own contracts. And this uh, campaign, which was uh, the Don't Get Screwed Over campaign, um, was, and, and one of the things that's great about paying attention to this area is that you have creative people that are making the materials to try to inform each other. So you get something like this, uh, Don't Get Screwed Over uh, campaign video. So. Okay. 
So there's been an effort to, uh, to um, inform the segment of, of, of working people about the necessity of a, a written contract. But the freelancer survey I mentioned, only 33% of the respondents always use uh, written contracts. And in fact, I would guess that a lot of the times when you have a freelancer who has a written contract, it's been prepared by a bigger company that they're uh, contracted with. But you know, there, there are different forms that this takes. There are a lot of smaller businesses hiring uh, freelancers to do all sorts of things, um, design work, web design, uh, things like that. Um, so if 33% of respondents are always using written contracts, that's not a good uh, perspe percentage. And that explains why I'm seeing all these unpaid invoices without anything in writing to back them up. So part of the solution then is, is not only informing people to use written contracts, but making sure first that the, the terms are good terms um, and terms that are going to be useful uh, and anticipate the problems. Um, but also, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the technology makes the process of contracting uh, potentially uh, much more uh, accessible, right? And so when I think about terms, what would be useful uh, for a freelancer to have in a con contract? Well, we see in the video clear definitions, the scope of the work, and what the expectations are. But payment schedule and benchmarks, so important. Look, a lot of creative people, they just want, they love the work they're doing, but they're not thinking about contract terms. And in fact, I just had a copy uh, uh, editor I worked with who does a lot of writing and, and reviewing uh, things that are written. He, he was, he just never thought of taking payment up front. Now we as lawyers know that, right? It's Foonberg's rule, right? Foonberg's rule is if someone isn't willing to pay you up front something, they're not going to pay you anything later. And so we need to bring that sort of mentality to um, uh, this group. Um, really important is intellectual property transfer upon payment in full. Right? Because you know, I design a logo for you. I give you a few versions of that logo. Now you have that logo in some electronic format. Uh, and you say, I don't, want, I, I don't like any of these. And then you could go start using it right? and, and create all sorts of problems for me. And I haven't been paid. So making the intellectual property transfer upon payment in full. And by the way, to the extent I've done some research to see who's writing about this sort of uh, narrow segment, um, that's what's been written. It's mostly in the intellectual property uh, realm. The termination fee is important, the kill fee, uh, which will be a percentage of the project's total cost. And finally, the most in important, and, and these aren't exclusive, there are other things, but is attorney's fees, right? Because when that person comes to you with the invoice as an attorney and it doesn't seem worth pursuing, well, if there's an attorney's fees clause in there, well, then there's some mechanism uh, to enforce the contract. And so the process of uh, contracting really um, is, is more accessible because of, of technology here. And I know other people have mentioned Shake Law, uh, this new app. I was playing around with it uh, uh, yesterday. I actually learned about it just uh, a few weeks ago. I attended Reinvent Law, which is it was a great program in New York City, and the, one of the founders of this app was there. And the idea is that you know you can create, sign, and send legally binding agreements. Just there's this app. You answer a series of questions, and it, it pumps out a contract for you. Um, there's also an automator, a contract automator that the Freelancers Union has on its website. Uh, but the, pro you know, the, the, the concern there is that they have to have terms that are useful uh, to uh, the freelancers in there. And one of the things I noticed on the Freelancers Union automator, and I'm at some point going to contact them and, and mention it, is it doesn't have an attorney's fees clause, right? which I think is probably the most uh, important thing uh, to give a mechanism for enforcement. But I encourage you, I have a video, I probably don't have time to show it, but about the Shake Law app. It's free to download, so I encourage you to download uh, and, and play around with it. And the contract I created yesterday, clicking through it, also I don't think had an attorney's fees clause, but I was speaking with someone at the cocktail hour last night who said when they played with it, they did get an attorney's fees clause. So um, uh, let's talk about legislative reforms with the time I have left, um, which aren't really taking us too far away from contract. Here's why. There's a a uh, proposed bill in New York, it actually passed New York's assembly, uh, but it keeps dying in committee uh, in the Senate. And it's the Freelancer Payment Protection Act, which essentially, in a nutshell, gives freelancers the ability to file unpaid wage claims with the Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor. Uh, the problem is, as a freelancer, you don't fit within the definition uh, of employer. And so when you don't get paid, you don't have the mechanism that employees have to just fill out a form file it with the Department of Labor about what you're owed. So this would change that and, and really give freelancers uh, that accessibility. Interestingly, uh, it defines those who can use this mechanism 
uh, they're uh, independent contractors, and that's the language used throughout uh, the, uh, the proposed amendment to the statute. But then independent contractor is in turn defined um, as sole, a sole proprietor who is not an employee and who is hired or retained by a client uh, for $600 or more. Uh, and so this is potentially uh, going to apply much more widely even to the people that I'm talking about here, the highly skilled, and it has actually the ability to maybe raise uh, uh, you know, prospects for more of that larger category of contingent workers. Uh, I don't know why the threshold was set at 600 or more. I don't know the import of that as the uh, uh, drawing line. But the other thing here that sort of trouble, the thing that troubles me is the definition is sole proprietor. <laughs> Uh, which means that uh, if you're a freelancer, I would think, that's incorporated or formed an LLC, then you don't have this mechanism. And most of those freelancers that are working with bigger companies, the bigger companies want them to incorporate. Why? Because then in that list of factors as to whether they're an employee or an independent contractor, if they have their own LLC, it's a really good uh, a bit of evidence that they're uh, independent and not an employee. So I think limiting this to sole proprietors is, is problematic. Of course, they define client, and client doesn't include uh, the, the government. Um, what it requires, it, well, the way it works is, uh, to give a little bit more detail, is that in, in, uh, a freelancer who hasn't gotten paid, if they file uh, a claim and there's no written contract, so it's encouraging written contracts that set out the terms, then there's a presumption uh, that uh, the freelancer gets uh, that the terms are what they claim them to be. And so what really this is trying to do is encourage the client side uh, to get written contracts and keep them uh, on uh, file. And um, you know what it entitles uh, freelancers to uh, is not only the unpaid wages, but there's a 25% uh, penalty and the statute has attorney's fees. Right, so that's uh, a good. Finally, with my last uh, minute, there are some potential market solutions here, do-it-yourself approaches. I had mentioned Elance earlier. Uh, this is a website, I encourage you to take a look at if you're interested in this stuff at all. Um, it's a website that's pairing people who need project-based work with people who do project-based work. Uh, actually, to play around with it, um, set up a profile. And what I'm realizing is every time I bid on a job uh, as an attorney, I get com there's someone you know in India who can do it for much much less. Um, so it's really interesting. It's also interesting because I think, it, as an aside, for attorneys using this, and there are a lot of attorneys using it as projects, project based attorneys. A lot of the descriptions to the people who need them don't say where they're located, right? So there's all and people are bidding on the jobs anyway. So there's a lot of potential uh, for uh, uh, ethics violations, and I actually think that this model, but made, and I'm sure somebody's doing this already, made with attorneys in mind to help people hire attorneys would be great. But anyway, Elance has an escrow uh, 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 payment protection. So um, it actually serves as an agent where if uh, you get hired for a project, uh, then the uh, client has to put money aside in escrow that's held by Elance and then um, uh, 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 released. And there's also another, uh, there's escrow.com. Finally, last point. Um, is the potential uh, reputational things that freelancers can do. Um, there is this, uh, the world's largest unpaid uh, invoice where people are posting uh, the amounts they're owed that they haven't been paid with uh, the names of clients. Uh, and so there are those um, uh, uh, options as well. But uh, that's my talk. I'm Rachel Arno Richmond. Um, let's see. Thank you so much um, to everyone who's here. Uh, when I saw that we were a, a panel exclusively devoted to employment law, um, I was really concerned that nobody would come. So um, I appreciate your being here. Um, I am going to speak, um, as our moderator said, about uh, the enforceability of what I think of as midterm modifications of employment contracts, um, though actually I'm going to say very little about adequate consideration, uh, other than that it's a really um, foul idea that really has no place in the doctrine. Um, and I'll get there. 
Uh, but first, um, what I'm talking about with respect to midterm modifications, um, what I mean is efforts by the employer to introduce a new and binding term subsequent to the start of the relationship, so the introduction of a non-compete and arbitration agreement, um, and also I fold in there changes to um, employee handbooks. Um, these are all areas where there's been uh, a lot of jurisdictional variation in approach. It's also an area where there is, I believe, a great deal of confusion about the applicability of contract doctrine. And so my goal is to provide a little bit of coherence to the law. Um, and for those of you who plan to um, come in and out and go to race off to other panels, um, to cut to the chase here, my thesis is that we should determine whether a modification is enforceable based not on consideration um, but on whether the employer provided reasonable notice of the change. Um, so this is a brand new project of mine, though. Um, for those of you who have been listening to me talk for the last 10 years, it probably sounds like a bunch of other things I've said, um, and that's because it's something I've thought about for a long time. Um, and so what I want to do is maybe just spend um, a minute sort of locating this uh, idea within um, a larger agenda. Then I'll, t I'll talk about this um, enforceability problem and modification as I think about it uh, and how courts are handling it. And then um, I have a few points about the advance notice model that I want to share. Um, okay, so first context. Uh, this is the continuation, as I said, of a long and perhaps hopeless quest to make some sense and frankly provide some integrity to employment contract law. Um, it looks like Peter's not here, but I know he's around. So, you know, like decades ago, uh, Peter Linzer wrote an article complaining that some of the uh, reasoning in the employment law cases of that time, and this was pretty much focused on the 1980s, um, was so poor that it would get an F in any, uh, if presented in any first year contracts exam. And that's true and still true today, only from my perspective it's actually worse um, than when Peter was writing about this topic. Um, unlike the chestnut cases of the 1980s where courts were uh, manipulating contract doctrine to achieve good results for workers, um, today courts are muddying the water uh, and establishing rules that really do very, very little to help workers and actually in many situations leave them worse off, in my opinion, than a more correct, um, if slightly less formalistic, application of the law. So um, modification is a great example of this. What am I talking about when I talk about modification? Um, this is in some ways really the first contribution of the project because the notion of modification uh, in an employment relationship, um, employment being at will, uh, is a pretty elusive context, uh, concept. Um, and I know that the whole notion of contract and employment is itself contested. And I'm going to kind of leave that to one side for a moment because I believe the relationship is contractual. Um, but to the extent that it is, it's highly re relational, of course. Um, which means that, from my perspective, that tells us that terms are really being uh, modified all the time as the parties' wants and needs evolve. They're highly incomplete, of course, so um, we know very little of the obligations are expressly articulated, which makes it very hard to distinguish a modification from what is sort of an elaboration on an implied expectation. Then, of course, the piece that they can be terminated at will. Um, so if there is a binding obligation, uh, it's indefinite in duration. So um, what does it mean to talk about modifications? Is modification a useful concept? And I think that it is, um, at least in situations where the employer intends the change to be legally binding. Um, and we certainly see that uh, in the three areas that I'm focusing on, the imposition of a non-compete, um, the imposition of an arbitration contract, uh, and the retraction or uh, modification adverse to the worker of a uh, previously um, promulgated employer policy. In the first two examples, of course, the employer's um, extracting a relinquishment of sort of baseline rights uh, from the worker, the right to compete, the right to sue in court. Um, in the last scenario, the employer's taking away a previously promised benefit. And as I'll mention, the way the litigation proceeds on the enforceability question generally presumes that the prior obligation that the employer um, took on through the voluntary policy was actually legally binding. Okay, so um, I think that in the way that I've sort of described this, um, there is a reason to really think about all of these types of changes together. 
Um, but that's not how courts treat them. Uh, for the most part, what you have in employment law, and this is, I think, part of a larger lament as someone who kind of lives in both the contracts world and the employment world, um, I think it, the, one of the critiques of the employment law world, I think, is that it's somewhat under theorized. Um, what you have, for the most part, is the law of each of these substantive areas, the law of non-competes, the law of arbitration agreements, um, and the law of handbook modification, and very um, little cross-pollinization, not uh, none, but very little. Um, and for the, well, I'm going to leave that aside for the sake of time, but um, I have more to say about that if you're interested. Uh, okay, so um, that said, there are common themes and there are common approaches. Uh, but I'm going to have to op oversimplify um, dramatically in doing this, um, which is to say there are two basic approaches, and I think they'll be uh, familiar to anyone who's looked or taught some it looked at this area, taught some of these cases. Um, what I think of as the unilateral modification approach um, and the formal modification approach. Neither of which, and I'll describe each, uh, neither of these is satisfying from a doctrinal perspective um, or a policy perspective, in my opinion. Um, so unilateral modification, this approach basically says, am I talking too fast? Can you guys follow me? Okay. Um, employment is at will, so that means employers can modify the terms of the relationship at any point um, with continued employment, that is the choice to retain the employee by the employer serving as the consideration. Um, we just adopted this approach in Colorado Supreme Court um, a few years ago in Looks Concrete, a case about a non-compete. Guy was a salesperson, hired to sort of expand from Denver out to the mountain region. For whatever reason, they didn't ask him to sign a non-compete when he started. Two years later, he signs it, no change in position, no change in responsibilities, and so on. Of course, he quits, works for someplace else. Um, the trial court, in the subsequent suit to enforce the non-compete, the trial court said that the contract, the non-compete, was not validly formed because the employee didn't receive anything in return and, and gave, uh, granted him summary judgment. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court reversed. It held that because, and the terminology here and the sort of the appeal to contract theory I find fascinating. Um, the court said that because employment at will is a continuing contract terminable by either party, um, the employer, of course, had the right to terminate at any point because the employer forbore from exercising that legal right, you know, kind of classic like first year consideration doctrine. Um, there was consideration uh, for the non compete. I actually think that technically this is the right analysis, um, if, at least if we assume. Uh, if we buy in completely to the existing understanding of employment at will that um, allows the employer absolute discretion to terminate any time, any reason, any matter, no warning, and so on. Um, and I challenge this premise um, in a, a prior piece that's on the slow track to coming out at uh, University of Florida, um, in which I argue that actually notice is required to terminate an at will employee. And I'm going to come back to that point. But um, for a moment, let's just say that. Um, if the traditional view is right, um, it certainly follows that the employer can introduce new, new terms unilaterally. Um, though, you know, I'm interested in a folks' thought on that. Okay, so here's the problem with that. Obviously, it's bad for workers. Um, the other problem with it is it kind of, it, it's subject to manipulation because it just doesn't sound right. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, you have courts saying basically, you know, they, they're troubled by this. They're saying, you know, how is it that the employee is receiving something in this transaction, um, given that the employer continues to be, be free to terminate for at any time, quite possibly the very next second? And so the employee really ha is no better off than he or she was before the change. How could there be consideration there? Okay, so this, I, I'm sympathetic to this concern, it, 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 but it leads courts to do very um, bizarre and frustrating things that um, are not only bad for doctrine, but as I've alluded to before, not helpful to workers. Um, and I'll just say as an aside, the one that drives me the most crazy uh, is the courts who say, continued employment, that's good consideration, but only if the employer really keeps the guy around for some unspecified period of time. So it's like this kind of um, consideration after the fact idea that um, I, I just would make you want to uh, pull your break, pull your hair out if you're a contracts professor, right? But but of course you know. Well, I'll just I'm going to leave that to one side because fortunately that's not most courts. The most common approach is. Um, to require some additional benefit. Um, and this is what uh, was mentioned before, so raise or promotion. And um, my neighbor to the north, Wyoming Supreme Court, um, took this approach. 
uh, also in, in the non-compete context, I'm focusing on the non-compete context. I don't want to go through all three areas with you, but I'm going to come back around to handbooks and probably skip arbitration agreements um, at this point. Um, but anyway, uh, sort of similar, uh, just to give you the example, um, that was a case about a vet who started working based on an oral agreement, um, and then she finally signed the formal agreement. Almost a year later, it had the non-compete. Court said, you know, you, you can't do that because there's no consideration that continued employment isn't enough. Um, but actually, lo and behold, the following year, um, she re-executed the agreement upon receiving a salary increase. Court said, ah, oh, okay, um, now the consider there's consideration for the non-compete. Um, Side point, um, it, there's actually been some legislative um, uh, development in the non-compete area, and uh, Oregon apparently now has a statute um, that requires that if you're, if you're going to enforce a non-compete, it either has to be at the start of employment, um, I'm happy to see with advance notice, uh, or it has to be upon um, a subsequent bona fide advancement of the employee by the employer. So. Um, you know, good as far as that goes. Um, I think it does need to be statutory, as I said, at least um, in the situation where uh, you're using a non-compete. Um, and I would say the same thing for arbitration agreements, though, as I said, I'm gonna leave, the, leave that out for now. Um, it's murkier in the handbook context, so I need to talk about um, this for a second. Um, at least where the modification um, is affecting um, a some kind of job security provision. Um, a minority of courts have rejected the unilateral modification approach in the handbook context under the theory that an employee who is covered by a job security policy isn't actually at will. Um, and so a good example of this, um, and I think an important one, because I think there's some tension here, is Demos v. ITT, which is the Arizona Supreme Court's decision in this area. By the way, still relatively few courts um, have actually weighed in on this area, and I don't think we're going to see um, there isn't a lot of litigation in this anymore, so I think these are the precedents that we're basically dealing with. Um, anyway, in that case, the manual promised that um, employees, uh, that reductions in force would be performed based on seniority. Okay, so that was the original handbook. Got modified a few times and eventually the seniority provision was eliminated and replaced with a performance-based um, approach to, to RIFs. And the court um, said that, you know, in order to modify the handbook, employer needs to provide new consideration, obtain employee consent, and continued employment won't give you either of these elements. Um, seeing as employer was contractually bound um, already by its layoff policy. So it, it, it's sort of, um, a riff on the pre-existing legal duty rule, um, but the court doesn't call it that. What's interesting, I think, is that the dissent, which obviously preferred the unilateral approach, um, resisted the premise that employees were at will, were no longer at will, based on the prior manual. And I'm actually somewhat sympathetic to that because I'm not sure that a layoff policy, um, which obviously contemplates that employer might at will elect to have a layoff, um, that creates a protocol for how layoffs will be conducted, you know, based on seniority, um, is the equivalent to the employer relinquishing the right to terminate at will, um, even if we accept the premise that the original manual was um, contractually binding. And uh, this is a question of the scope of the legal duty, is what this is. Um, if you want to continue with that uh, pre-existing legal duty analogy, um, the posture of the case forced the court to disregard that threshold question, okay? Um, it was conceded that the policy um, was binding. But I, the point is this. Uh, I think that um, a rule requiring some additional benefit in order for a modification to be binding um, is only going to be doctrinally correct in a small subset of cases, factually speaking. Um, it's certainly not going to protect an employee from uh, unilateral modification of changes uh, of, of policies not dealing with job security, so vacation benefits and things like that. Um, and it certainly doesn't work in the non-compete and arbitration case, okay? So, um, right, because there was no suggestion that the employee is anything but at will to begin with. Um, and of course, this goes to my other point, it doesn't help the worker anyway, right? So what um, if we require the employer to provide new consideration in the form of a raise for promotion or so on, unless the employee um, is otherwise unable to fire, like in that subset of cases, if you buy into that involving modification of security provisions, um, the employee has to accept 
Uh, and whatever the employer promises is arguably as illusory, a word that the courts love to use in this area, as the promise of continued employment, seeing as that the continuation of that benefit and so on um, is contingent on continued employment. So if, if the goal of this move is fairness, it doesn't really level the playing field um, at all. So this brings me to the last piece, um, which is to describe what I think is a more coherent approach that serves workers better and actually, in my opinion, isn't terrible uh, from employers' perspective, um, and that's to hinge enforceability not on uh, continued employment or a substantive benefit, um, but really using advance notice um, in which uh, notice, rather than the continued employment or the substantive benefit, is the consideration for the modification, and also, incidentally, um, a good way of enhancing the quality of assent. Um, and so I, I have four, I hope, um, well, one long and three short points about this. Um, so first, this is already um, a big theme in a subset of the cases, in the cases involving um, handbook modification under the, what I've called the unilateral approach. Um, what you see is several courts sort of either referencing as a factual matter the fact that an employer provided advance notice of a modification, um, or even going further and actually explicitly um, sort of marking the advance notice as, as sort of part of the court's ruling and part of the holding, um, though they're incredibly fuzzy on the rationale, doctrinal rationale for this. Um, California is the big one on this, Asmus v. Pacific Bell, which you probably many of you are familiar with, which involved a management employment security policy. Um, and it's worth pointing this out because uh, you know, this is one of those situations where kind of important things about the facts don't really figure in that well and are not especially memorable um, when you look at the decision. So this, um, this, is, this policy promised to provide employees with employment security through reassignment and retraining for other management positions. Uh, in the event their job was eliminated. And as a side note, um, the policy itself was indefinite in duration. The, the employer actually had put in the policy that um, the policy could be suspended if it materially affected the employer's business plan. Um, but that piece of it wasn't litigated. Um, and the, employ the posture employer was saying, we, we're going to concede that there were no, or we're going to assume no material adverse changes in our business plan. We're just arguing that we can change it unilaterally. Um, but they didn't just change it unilaterally, right? What they did was they took steps. So, so four years after the policy was issued, um, the employer sends out a letter to management saying, um, FYI, we're monitoring market conditions. We may have to change our security policy. Um, then two years later, they make an announcement that they are going to change the policy, um, but it's not going to be effective until six months. Um, and then six months later, they change the policy, um, at which point the employees have known for two years that it might happen and for six months that it really will. Um, in any event, in holding in favor of the employer, the California uh, Supreme Court uh, asserted that reasonable notice was required in order for the employer to alter what it described as a unilateral implied in fact contract. Okay? Um, and this is actually the approach that the recent restatement of employment law has adopted, though interestingly they don't have a rationale for why um, either. And uh, in most other contexts I'd be very loath to cite that document. So um, this is just one of very a handful of areas where I think they actually picked the right rule, though as I said they don't seem to know why. Um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to offer something to you because this is very early stage and so I just want to offer to you really just to get feedback on this um, and then I just have a few uh, short comments but um, I want to, to read to you the explanation in the Asmus um, v. Pacific Bell case as to why reasonable notice is required um, because I want you to tell me if I'm crazy um, or if there, this makes sense to you. Um, the court said, quote, under contract theory, an employer may terminate a unilateral contract of indefinite duration as long as its actions occur after a reasonable time and is subject to prescribed or implied limitations, including reasonable notice. I have never heard that rule, and I don't know what a unilateral contract of indefinite duration is. So um, check, talk to me afterwards, okay? Um, what I do think, though, is that there is a way to make sense of this rule from a contract theory perspective. Um, it requires thinking of employment at will in a very different way. Um, and this is uh, my, my next point, drawing on the paper that I wrote about reasonable notice of termination. Um, the whole premise 
of modification doctrine and all of contract law, employment contract law theory rests on this idea that employment is a unilateral contract under which the employee makes no promises um, and the uh, only obligation is to pay if the employee performs. So that's a terrible way of characterizing the employment relationship, an incredibly awkward way um, of dealing with a relationship which, first of all, almost always begins with a promissory acceptance. Oh yeah, I'll take the job, right? Um, generally contemplates a long-term performance uh, and over which, during which people make numerous explicit and implicit promises. That sounds like a bilateral contract to me, um, albeit one that is of indefinite duration. And once we call it bilateral, then I think a doctrinal basis for a notice rule emerges because reasonable notice is the default rule um, for termination under the UCC 2309. Um, I think it's also the rule under common law, though the employment at will cases have so muddied the common law on termination of indefinite relationships, it's sometimes hard to tell, but I think that is the right um, analysis, and it folds in with other theories like good faith and so on that are well established. Um, okay, so um, that makes um, a lot of sense to me. I, my time is up, so here's, I'm just gonna say two more things quickly that um, I don't have a ton of time for. Um, one, I think this script this is uh, sort of point four, uh, point three, I think this description not only works doctrinally, I think it's more consistent with sort of trends in contract law, which are sort of away from unilateral contract theory, away from consideration for modifications, um, giving more choice to the parties about the form of the contract, the manner of acceptance, and certainly viewing modification through a lens of the process of achieving fair modifications rather than consideration for what is provided. And that last but not least, um, back to this idea about how it can help workers. I'll just end with um, the, a, a quote from the dissenting judge in the Damas handbook case, which, um, who wrote in support of the unilateral modification approach, quote, the right to quit in opposition to changed policies is properly characterized as a right. Um, that was sort of in support of the idea that uh, no additional consideration would be required for modification. Um, I think that's true but it's only with advance notice that a typical employee is able to exercise that right. Thank you. So um, first, let me thank uh, Jennifer and Marcia for, the, for take, taking care of us for this great opportunity. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the role of the court uh, uh, during Japan's industrialization, uh, focusing on the silk weaving industry, uh, which led Japan's industrialization from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. And let me talk about my motivation very quickly. <coughs> uh, so. If uh, when well, financial markets are imperfect, uh, workers themselves might not be might not be able to finance human capital investment in themselves and the transportation costs of themselves, then uh, uh, it should be financed by uh, somebody else, and they are, uh, by doing so, uh, welfare could be improved. Um, and then the device needs uh, uh, perfected claims placed on workers such as uh, slavery and indentured labor, uh, which had been historically used. Yeah, but if slavery and indentured labor are prohibited, uh, some uh, conflict between labor market mobility and protection of employers' claim and potentially emerge, could, could emerge. Uh, what, what kind of conflicts? Uh, if protection of employers' claim is insufficient, uh, then natural investment in, and transportation of workforce would be less than optimal uh, in, 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 in Shanxi Tan. And if freedom of, but uh, at the same time, if freedom of work mobility is constrained, uh, then a better employer employee matches would be impeded, wouldn't be reached out. Uh, so, under liberalization of workforce, a balance between some balance between protection of employers' claims and mobility of employees must be considered, particularly in narrow phase of development where private and public financing uh, for uh, worker uh, human, uh, human capital investment and workers' transportation are highly imperfect. 
Uh, then, uh, uh, my case is uh, the 1896 civil court regime in Japan, uh, which did not allow any perfected claim placed on workers. For comparison, in the case of the United States, indentured laborers, indentured contracts became illegal as late as in 1917s. Uh, so, uh, so, so this act was very progressive given the stage of Japan's development. And, uh, and, also, and then I focused on the silk weaving industry, which was the driving force of Japan industrialization, uh, centered in Suwa County, Nagano Prefecture. So uh, the, the regional labor market of this county is, the, is exactly my case. Okay, so and, uh, uh, let me talk about uh, my results first. Uh, in the first phase, until the end of the 1890s, employers from, uh, uh, from whom workers moved had recourse to the court for enforcement, for exact performance of employment contract. But uh, in the second phase, uh, from the early, uh, early 1900s, uh, employers came to privately sell trade uh, with a possible lawsuit as an outside option. Uh, so uh, first, uh, the court exactly um, uh, uh, ordered employees to perform the original employment contract, but uh, uh, that uh, transaction disappeared quickly, and uh, uh, the court uh, came to be a kind of uh, came to become a kind of shadow uh, uh, to stabilize a private settlement in the labor market. Okay, th th these are primary results of my uh, paper. Then uh, let me talk. Uh, so first, uh, uh, let me talk about situation in, in the labor market of this industry. Uh, the point is, uh, uh, more and more arcade competition for workers, and uh, uh, I imagine dual employment contract. Uh, so uh, uh, this industry centered in uh, this county, this region, Suwa County, Nagano Prefecture, uh, very central uh, region in Japan. And uh, this industry uh, experienced rapid growth uh, of labor demand since the 1880s, uh, roughly a um, um, uh, 10 percentage increase uh, 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 every year. And the most workers were young female uh, people or from rural areas. So uh, uh, hiring workers from decent areas and training them uh, costed some uh, circulating manufacturers. So uh, these guards uh, should have been um, uh, uh, brought by uh, uh, companies, and uh, that cost uh, should be uh, uh, should be um, <coughs> burdened by companies uh, f uh, which hired uh, those people. And so uh, uh, competition for workers led to dual contracting and poaching. Uh, uh, for instance, typical situation is yes, um, uh, the county was in a, uh, 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 in a kind of basin, uh, so uh, uh, roads into the region uh, 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 were only uh, s several, uh, several, uh, several ways. So uh, in, in, in each gate, so so when 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 the worker uh, 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 came to this uh, region uh, from a distant area. Uh, then a uh, new employer, entrant employer, uh, uh, put the her uh, to economize the transportation cost and also advance payment, something like that uh, happened. <coughs> Then, uh, fa uh, farmers food workers were poached that had recourse to the court, uh, the World Court of Kamisua, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the court for first instance. And, and uh, there were two kinds of uh, uh, lawsuits. Uh, and one was uh, suits against workers who, who uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, sorry, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, farmers' food workers were reported were hard recourse to the state, uh, the state of court, the world of court of Kamisua, and uh, the, these lawsuits are uh, suits against workers who failed to fulfill employment contract with them, and 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 and, and uh, so so uh, their their uh, lawsuit war was war, lawsuit war. Uh, for uh, fulfillment of employment contract, performance of employment contract, or uh, for damages. Uh, so uh, there are two. There were two kinds of uh, lawsuits uh, related to uh, dual contract. Uh, one is a lawsuit uh, for performance of employment contract or for damages. Uh, and uh, this type of lawsuit uh, still had recourse to the state court for for the enforcement of uh, for, uh, for the enforcement of employment contract. But uh, another kind of uh, lawsuit was a suit for damages for non fulfillment of the employment contract. And uh, in this case, uh, it's just for damages. Uh, 
uh, given non fulfillment of the employment contract. Okay. <clears throat> then, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, potentially, the, 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 there were these two kinds of employment uh, lawsuits, and, this, and uh, these lawsuits. Uh, uh, related to implement contract uh, transformed uh, during the period. While issues related to implement contract had included uh, uh, lawsuits for fulfillment of performance of implement contract in the mid-1890s, uh, after 1900, only lawsuits just for damages came to be filed at this uh, world court, at this state court. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it's too, <laughs> too small. Yeah. So uh, basically, my point is, uh, 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 before 1900, uh, there were still uh, some lawsuits uh, for uh, employment contract performance, but after 1900, uh, uh, only for uh, damages, uh, lawsuits came to be filed. Okay. Uh, then, uh, 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 let me examine what really happened. Uh, actually, uh, when I when I examined uh, when I uh, uh, when I explored uh, uh, several cases filed at this water court, uh, I found uh, several strange things uh, to be explained somehow. Uh, uh, for for instance, in some cases, a defendant uh, employee, uh, which was employee, lost by default judgment, such that she had to pay the all damages to her. Uh, its employer, uh, which, uh, which often amounted to her half or uh, full annual income. Or uh, in some cases, the defendant sh showed up and acknowledged the plaintiff's uh, its employer's assertion and the loss so that she had to pay uh, all the damages anyway. And in some cases, the plaintiff, uh, plaintiff uh, its employer, withdrew the lawsuit. And uh, in some cases, a worker filed against a next employer for payment of contracted wages and lost by default judgment. Uh, so, uh, so, so uh, I, I needed to explain these strange cases. And uh, uh, then uh, my guess is uh, actually uh, there were two kinds of uh, transactions behind the losses. Uh, so two possible or real trades in, uh, in a suit filed by an employer against, in, uh, against his employee uh, uh, could, be, uh, could be considered. One is uh, really between an employer and employee, and the, uh, uh, which occurred when a worker did not fulfill a performed employment contract uh, and withdrew from the labor market, uh, typically uh, uh, when she got sick. Uh, and the other one is uh, actually between relevant employers, original employer and thank you, and the approaching employer, <clears throat> uh, uh, which occurred when the worker moved to another factory. Okay, and then uh, what kind of ruling did the court deliver in the first case? Uh, the court basically dismissed the claim uh, uh, by a plaintiff, uh, original employer, uh, because the civil court allowed an immediate cancellation of employment contract for an avoidable reason, which was the so typical sickness of an employee. Uh, so, uh, in other words, if the court delivered the ruling that all the defendant employee uh, to be damaged for no fulfillment of employment contract, uh, the real transaction. The, the court uh, implicitly understood that the real transaction did not seem to have been um, uh, between employee and employee. Okay? Uh, so the court actually uh, governed trade between employers uh, or trade between manufacturer who the worker was poached and the manufacturer who poached her. Uh, so by uh, by figure uh, maybe uh, it, again it, it's maybe it's uh, uh, too small. So did uh, did the, 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 the manufacturers and uh, when the worker moved to uh, this manufacturer, uh, original manufacturer uh, 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 filed a suit against her. Uh, but uh, real, real transactions uh, were uh, between this guy and this guy, and not not necessarily between uh, this person and this person. And then, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the negotiation process uh, was uh, 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 naturally in um, uh, uh, accordance with uh, civil court procedure, uh, 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 which defined uh, a civil case procedure. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, let, me, let me skip this part uh, because of time constraint. Uh, so, uh, in, in that, but uh, uh, let, let me explain a little bit uh, about this procedure. Uh, uh, in that period, uh, civil court procedure of Japan 
a, a road uh, <clears throat> appeal to uh, appeal to the lowest cost. Uh, so, uh, so in the relevant employers uh, could use uh, could use uh, uh, a lawsuit uh, filed as a lowest cost twice, uh, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, and this uh, formulated the complicated uh, procedure of uh, settlement outside of the court, uh, but uh, uh, given the potential threat uh, by uh, by the uh, legal sanction. Uh, yeah. Hmm? <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> <laughs> what happened? About it? Oh, yeah. Shoot, shoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, then, then the possible question is, uh, uh, why, why uh, the court only indirectly governed uh, trade between uh, employers? Uh, uh, it, it, it's partly because, uh, or it's mainly because the court couldn't directly govern a trade between employers uh, when the bystander when the bystander puts the employee. Uh, because the civil court uh, uh, does not assume that the claim uh, uh, to an employee uh, is effective against the bystander. Uh, and also, uh, uh, bystanders, a third party infringe. <laughs> Just continue with, oh, yeah. it may be a little more difficult. I don't, hopefully something will come back. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm also all, almost wrapping up. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, and another reason is uh, 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 a third party infringement of an employment uh, uh, employer's claim uh, to his or her employee was not a to uh, tortious, tortious interference stipulated by the civil court. Uh, so poaching itself was a quite legal activity. Uh, so, or the, the court uh, couldn't, couldn't directly govern trade between employers. Uh, so the, the court uh, uh, directly govern uh, transactions between employers and employees, but potentially, or in fact, uh, the court came to govern trade uh, between employers in the labor market. Yeah. <coughs> uh, then, uh, uh, another possible <coughs> question is, uh, but why still? Uh, lawsuit was filed uh, because the outcome is well, uh, should be quite observable or in the, uh, uh, the, the existence of the court might be important as a, a, a potential threat or outside option or uh, of the equilibrium past but uh, still uh, uh, there were there existed lawsuit why uh, it should be explained uh, yeah so uh, <coughs> A, a, a possible explanation about the existence of the lawsuit was uh, that, uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, discount practices were not necessarily common uh, as a shared uh, standard necessarily. Uh, some employers uh, uh, could be less patient, and, uh, and such less patient uh, in order to in order to uh, in order to get such impatient uh, uh, employers uh, to be back to private settlement, uh, sometimes uh, real legal sanction was necessary. Uh, that's why uh, uh, yeah, that's why uh, uh, lawsuits really happened. <coughs> uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, given the number of uh, workers, uh, which uh, roughly are uh, 10,000, uh, the number of lawsuits uh, was uh, rather quite small. Uh, uh, so uh, real legal lawsuits, real, real lawsuits were uh, used only if relevant parties were, uh, uh, were, uh, were less patient than average employers. <coughs> And uh, then, uh, 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 let, let me let me complete my uh, presentation. Uh, so, 
Yeah, so and, uh, as I talked, uh, uh, indirect governance by the state court uh, was functional, uh, uh, finally, uh, but at the same time, it was quite costly. Uh, the cost of this uh, kind of standard process was about uh, 7 yen uh, to each party, except for a pay, uh, fee uh, paid for lawyers or damages. Uh, 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 meanwhile, transportation cost for each worker uh, in at that time was just uh, half yen or and the advance, advance payment was just one and two yen. Uh, so uh, given that cost, uh, legal cost was quite high. Uh, and so uh, indirect governance by the state court was functional, but still it was very costly. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, naturally, in the uh, uh, 1903, uh, through giving manufacturers established a private mechanism to try the claims to employees uh, such as common uh, these days uh, in professional sports. And, uh, 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 but still, uh, the, uh, the court uh, uh, did have uh, its own uh, uh, role. Uh, for, for this private mechanism to work well uh, uh, in, a, in a stable way, uh, a possible lawsuit was still uh, important as an outside option. Yeah, so that's it. I have a number of questions, but I'm going to defer to the audience because time is short, and I'm sure you all have questions. If you don't, I'm happy to ask mine, but um, we've got Meredith, Masaki, and Rachel. Yes. is necessary. I think notice is necessary. If you want to call that new consideration, you can. Um, I think in terms of the significance of disclaimers, I'll, I'll just sort of side note, that's why we don't have any more litigation in this area. So I, I mentioned that. Um, but what I, yes, the, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, just as I see notice is required in the non-compete context and the arbitration context where there's no suggestion that the employee is anything but at will, so we don't have to dispute whether the handbook creates rights or not, whether the disclaimer is effective. Um, yeah, I still see that as something that is inherent in, in the sort of the nature of the relationship as being um, contractual but indefinite. I'm using Rachel's case for I'm speaking in employment law for the first time again. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say it publicly and not apologize. Um, is, how does notice looking these situations in English different, right? For for example, Absolutely. if it's a non compete clause, could notice just be giving an employee a week to sign it, to give them the non compete? Or is it maybe handbooks? How does that like in different states? Yeah, so, um, and this is something that. Um, I discuss in, in some of the earlier papers um, on the subject that it deal with termination as opposed to modification. Um, so, I mean, my view of it is that, um, it, it, I mean, sort of by analogy to contract to, to commercial law, um, I mean, what is reasonable notice in the UCC context? It's very clear what it is. It's in the comments. It's in the case law. It's the amount of time that parties need to consider alternatives and prepare for the loss of the relationship. So if it's a supply contract, you need to have as much time as is necessary to find another long-term supplier. So I think in the employment context, it's the amount of time necessary for the employee to reasonably consider market alternatives. Um, and that would vary, of course, really not so much based on the nature of the terms that are supplied, but on the nature of the relationship and the quality of the market. Mm-hmm. 
how long do I have to answer? <laughs> um, no, that's okay. So um, I'll just take your, your, your second question first, which uh, they're related actually for me. Um, why not have um, an employment code? Well, this is the third paper in a series of three. The first paper, which um, I can give to you, so the UCLA Law, UCLA Law Review basically advocates for a statute that says this, um, requiring notice. It's what we have in every European country, um, requirement of notice, even, I mean, separate and apart from whether there's unfair dismissal laws, which generally there are. Um, we, I mean, some would say in the um, employment law, in the scholarly community amongst workplace law professors, um, there was a lot of discussion about this at the time that the restatement was drafted. Um, many people thought we should be doing some kind of model law instead. Um, history on that was the Model Employment Termination Act about 20 years ago. It was passed by the ALI. It was never successful. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons why we don't have that. And certainly um, legislation um, protecting employees is not in the offing. Um, given the political climate in this country. So um, it would have to be a uniform law process, and then it's a question of legislative adoption. So I don't think it's practical. That was my first paper. Um, and basically, I came to this because I needed to have a common law strategy um, in light of the fact that I don't think legislatures are going to do it. Now, that is sort of why you say, why consideration? I mean, there are two answers to that. First is I'm trying to locate, I'm very strategically trying to locate this in contract doctrine. I would like to see impact litigation in this area. My sort of, um, I'm starting this paper, but really my, the next thing I want to do isn't another law review article. It's an article to practitioners about how to bring these cases um, using the contract law. Um, but, um, well, maybe I should just, I should just leave it there. Um, but there are other theories. I guess what I'll say is there are other theories um, besides consideration. Good faith, obviously, is one of them. Um, in the second paper, I, I talk about other theories besides consideration. Um, but the, the other piece, I guess, is that um, on, the, on the scholarly side, my sort of larger goal is to have a coherent theory, not just of modifications, but employment contracts generally. You have to come up with an understanding of why this is a binding relationship. And I think that you can't ignore consideration in that. Um, calculus. I have a question for Ms. Hawkins as well, but I'm just taking one of the and I'm sure you have a question for me on this. Um, I noticed in your paper you discussed a very briefly about the U.S. experience in 1917 and talked a little bit about England courts. Did you, have you looked at the experience of other countries in Asia, whether it's China, what was going on with enforcement of these rights um, around the same time? Uh, not yet, not yet. Um, but and uh, it's not necessarily easy uh, because also in this case, uh, uh, formally, um, uh, 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 the, the the act, the the, uh, the law didn't assume that the court governed uh, uh, trade between employers. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, so, a formal uh, uh, formal object or a formal structure of the judicial system and the real function. Uh, was a little different uh, in, in, in such a situation, and it's the same uh, in in, dif in another in, in another con in uh, in other countries. Um, but uh, so, f f uh, according to my knowledge, in the case of France, uh, uh, private company is heavily subsidized by the state government uh, uh, imported almost indentured workers from Poland or other Eastern Europe uh, uh, until the end of the 1920s. Uh, so uh, some uh, similar device worked uh, but, uh, in different countries in different contexts, but uh, uh, for the similar purpose. I have one question for Meredith, but I'll defer to the 
Um, well, it's certainly not okay in the non-compete context because now you can't even go to a competitor, right? I mean, I think it's your point that there are different, sort of it's more onerous in certain situations than in others. Um, but the reason I'm not abstracting those in particular is because I think that um, at a theoretical level, we want comparable doctrinal rules um, this always makes me think of, you know, is this is the one line in Hill v. Gateway that actually makes sense? This isn't about the law of software, it's about the law of contracts, right? You know, that we have to have kind of a, an approach, th that's the problem, right? We have an approach right now that looks at sort of the effectiveness of non-competes and their consequences and treats non-competes differently um, through a lens of sort of their substantive consequences without kind of a basic contract formation principle that guides them. So what I'm trying to do would be I think that as a policy matter, sure, there are more reasons for it in that situation, um, but in terms of a, a theoretical approach to formation, I think it should be uniform. I'll ask my question of Meredith really quickly, and then we'll wrap up and let anyone else have more questions. Um, the, uh, the Department of Labor has announced a number of crackdowns that they're working to classification. We've got 15 states with memorandum of understanding, including New York State. Um, have you thought about, uh, as you probably have, looking at the longer term freelancers that are probably independent contractors that may not be called anything um, and maybe getting, uh, losing out on all the potential benefits that the Department of Labor and the states are looking at. Um, and then the IRS, of course, is also doing their crackdowns on employers. So looking at it in terms of, instead of going to the wage board or New York or that kind of thing, focusing more at the federal level. It's a, it's a good question. That's something I'll consider. And now we can't launch. <laughs> <laughs>